Hello, my name is Julia, and I'm part of Light Play, a group of graduate students at Teachers College. We create um, solutions for education purposes. Today, I have here with me two other members, Jaehyun over here, and Jess. <coughs> So recently, our group gathered together to answer this question. How can we use augmented reality to help autistic children learn more effectively? According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in 59 children in the United States have been identified with autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, also known as ASD, is an umbrella term that includes disorders such as ADHD, OCD, and um, ADD. In order to create a human-centered design, we partnered with a special education school in Yonkers. And through teacher interview, we found that autistic learners easily forget learned concepts. And for teachers, it is very difficult to teach autistic children in typical learning environments. So for example, um, this is a recent article about a student named Emma. She's an autistic learner. In the classroom with her teacher, she learned how to differentiate bicycles through flashcards. The flashcard that she learned from showed a bicycle that was red in color. However, when she stepped stepped outside of the classroom and was walking down the street with her mom, she was unable to identify bicycles on the street that were different of color. Now, autistic children have different needs and abilities and symptoms. However, for, um, to going back to the question that we wanted to answer, we wanted to focus on creating a solution for students who struggle to communicate and connect abstract concepts to real life. And so we decided to focus on helping them learning shape and identifying them in their own surroundings. So the reason why we use shape is because shape recognition is a fundamental skill that later influences learners' ability to recognize letters. In fact, shapes are long-term objectives in the CABAS curriculum, which our partner school uses, and is taught as a general skill before learning numbers, letters, and words. So the current method of instruction teachers use to teach this concept is flashcards. Whether it is paper or electronic, teachers have students compare different shapes and objects to test their understanding of shapes. The iPad is used very closely in the classroom, and the school we worked with had a close to one-on-one -on -one ratio of iPads supplies to students. Usually, each individual student has an iPad that is used through the day. The teachers use this to have immediate access to different resources and to give students free time as a new year. The iPad is effective um, in helping ASD learners stay focused and we wanted to further utilize this tool to help the children learn more e effectively. So our team is in development of designing an AR experience that can be used as a supplemental tool for ASD students and teachers. The greatest strength of AR is that it helps learners transfer and apply concepts learned to their actual surroundings. This can resolve a common problem ASD learners go through, where they easily forget concepts learned in the classroom. The anticipated result of this solution in, um, is that it will allow students to continue learning outside and practice applying concepts in their life. So here is the video of user testing of our current prototype. <laughs> Thank you. 
current prototype looks like this. A round will be used in between current methods of instruction. Teachers will start off by teaching shapes with flashcards. When students have illustrated a working knowledge of shapes, an around will be used to help students identify shapes in their surroundings. The teacher will navigate around the classroom with the learners to use around. Together, they will explore, cap explore, capture, guess, and check the answers. So we made some sort of observation with a uh, shoulder between the age of two to five with different level of ASD. We saw that nine out of 12 students understood the concept of uh, augmented reality and how to use the application around. Also, nine out of 12 students were engaged in using the application and wanted to use the app again. We also have teachers few questions regarding how, if they, were, if they ever used AR applications before, if they think they could use AR applications to teach, and how engaged the students were using AR applications. So here are some few quotes from the teachers. Um, she says, I was skeptical about using AR application in classroom. However, around changed my opinion when I saw how the students were engaged and willing to try the application. They were very excited to explore the classroom by using around to look for more circles. And I can see myself using around to teach the shapes when the application is able to detect more shapes. So with these, we're still developing our application. And these are the next steps we're working on from the feedbacks and user testing. First, we're going to have more shapes, such as tri uh, triangles, squares, and maybe special shapes, such as stars and whatever they are. Um, we're also thinking of uh, designing applications to fit the school's curriculum, such as the school is right now using Kappa's curriculum, which is for uh, ASD students partic in particular. So we're trying to match that curriculum very well. Uh, in addition, we're trying to make a new mod mode in the application where we can compare and contrast shapes. And we're also looking for more schools to conduct user test uh, Thank you for listening to our pre presentation. Please use our website for more information. It's lesslifeplay.com. Uh, sorry. And our email is lifeplay.com at gmail. <laughs>
He went back to South Korea where he's running his game studio called Mao Dong. And he's also part of the other game lab, um, so we are working very closely together. Um, let's get serious. So it's a game for um, cancer patients. So you have to go into the locations. We are collaborating with the Charité. You maybe know it's like this huge hospital for rich Russian people in, uh, in Berlin. And we went there and we spent a lot of days, long days, and like really depressing days uh, with cancer patients like in all uh, states of, of health. And, um, but I think that's, just, that's I mean, for sure needed if you want to read the, the thing into deep. Um, and the question, our main question is how or can game help cancer patients? And uh, can it at all help? And if so, yes, how? That's the big question. Um, and it's an ongoing procedure. So I'm not going to present results. It's, I take you into the ongoing um, development process. Why is it so important to go into the hospital? It's like the first health sector, right? We have like, not millions, but like 150,000 plus health games in the app stores. And this shows that there's a huge demand for doing something. So there are a lot of consumers downloading whatever you can think of in the sector of health apps, but we do not have this in the, in the real health sector, in the hospitals. Um, I mean, we all know these great games like Remission or the Brain Cancer or Elude. It's like, perfectly fine, it's great. Um, and I think we have to, to go um, to continue this work and to go really into the first um, health sector, so working with hospitals very closely and developing for real world patients. Okay, so that's just uh, to show you how much how much we work. It's uh, too small, and if it would be bigger, it would be in German, so we would be, yeah, it would be something. But um, it's like part of our analysis, so, and already, seeing that like, calling a patient or player's journey shows that it can be very fruitful to let just two, two terminologies collide. Because um, as a doctor, you always analyze um, the patient journey in terms of parameters, uh, what's, what went better, what, uh, what is the problem, and how does the, the patient feel. But as a game designer, you look for um, rewards, for feedback loops. You look for tiny amounts of, I don't want to say fun, because I mean, cancer will never be fun. But you know what I mean, like small portions of motivation and to get the engagement enhanced. So breaking it down, this analysis, um, you get this graph. It's super simple. You have your normal life, then you get your first diagnosis, and then you everything is shaking and everything is lost, what you need for. That's what we call the liminal phase, and then normally, like through therapy and treatment and remission and whatever, you try to get back to green. Um, and um, in this particular project, we are facing uh, multiple myeloma, so it's not curable yet. It, you will never go back to green, okay? You will always be like, um, you will have different phases, but it will never be as it was before. So making it even more simple, it's, uh, that's what you get. You had before in your normal life, you were competent in your language, in your professional language, in your everyday language with your family. Also, the rooms uh, you were in, the architecture, you knew it. Same is true for practices. But once, from one second to another, everything is lost. And it's just a huge black nothing with a big question mark. And so this is what we thought we might start with to, um, to help the patient. Um, yeah, another graph, so it's a wall of knowledge, as you can call it too. You have the symptoms and the cancer at, on the patient side, and on the other side you have all the knowledge, all the practices, you know, all the other all rooms and whatever is needed. And it's not that they don't want to talk with each other, but they have this big wall of knowledge, which makes it really difficult. So that's our first um, sketch for gameplay. By old school, um, from a bird's perspective, you are steering an avatar, you are um, running through a map, a hospital map. We were thinking of maybe implementing a real hospital map so that you can play and afterwards like it's a real architecture so that your orientation is better. Um, you get terminology, some knowledge, equities. Once you enter a room, you um, learn what's going on in the room. You get more detailed information you can collect and um, one step after the other, you get an archive of knowledge. But just 
you know, just sketching it, thinking about it, play testing it a little bit, we thought this looks like a serious game no one would play. So we don't have the budget to make it graphically, you know, like fancy. It's like too old school, so we just skipped it and started from uh, scratch again. What we decided was skip the avatar. Okay, let's get straight to what was the problem about. Let's get real. And the main thing is put the patient in the drivers. So what, what do you need to do that? Um, so we started again, and sorry, um, that's basically where we are right now. So what we want to give the patient is the feeling of you have some control over it. Uh, you can, it's controllable, it's manageable. So the gameplay is putting the patient in the role of the, of the doctor. So he is managing, ther managing therapies. And I don't know if you know Democracy 2 or paper clips. So you don't have to be graphically advanced to give a proper gameplay. It's just about managing numbers, and that's actually what doctors do. So you start with a certain setting. Um, then you have uh, uh, different choices for different therapies. You fire the therapies, you get the results, you check the results, and that's the core gameplay. Um, at the same time, you are a patient. So um, you, you kind of give you the opportunity of being both, being the doctor and being also the patient at the same time because you, can, you have your life goals. You have things you want to achieve in the rest of your time which is available. So you manage therapies and you manage yourself as a patient. Um, and this is what it's all about. To communicate, it's manageable. So yes, um, there will be times where it's where it's really hard, where you'll suffer pain, and when you undergo treatment, it's, not, it's, it's never going to be fun. But um, in the um, gameplay, it's all about the goal to go over 50% um, and to reach life quality that is um, like enjoyable. You can still go with your dog, you can still go swimming or have some quality time with your family. So it's manageable, that's, that's the first uh, of the um, um, most important communication goal. Okay, somebody um, screenshots from uh, our uh, mobile application. So but what you can see already is, yes, you have, it's only about numbers, it doesn't have to look fancy, but if the game mechanics are implemented properly, I'm pretty um, sure um, that we can get the most motivated. So you have starting point, you became a patient, you start managing the patient, you fire therapies, you uh, get the uh, feedback whether there is a response to the treatment or not, um, you, um, you learn that there are certain side effects, you have a healing card, you can define certain life goals, and you know that's, that's the key um, mechanic. And that's where we are right now, I mean, um, what I think is, if we, if we come to this point that we can implement it and really test it out in the clinic, that would be a huge success, because the game design is one point, the other, the other thing is, um, you know, you are, um, as game like designers, we are um, working with a system that is like really slow, which is um, like over the work, right? so they have great doctors, but whoever worked in the health system knows that they are working like 12 hours, and then they show me game designers, right? After 12 hours, no, not a good idea. Um, um, yeah, um, and also we have ethical and moral implications, right? So, shall we really call it a game? So what we plan right now is to give the game uh, up the diagnosis. So you are totally shocked, and then the doctor says, oh, you know, this don't know it, or there's a tablet, play a game. It's, going to help you. So this is also something we have to figure out if this works. And there are a lot of other problems which might be interesting for you guys. I mean, I, I want to let you guess how many people or how, and how many time they have for data privacy issues uh, in Berlin in speciality per week. What do you think? How many hours they have? Less than hours? 10 hours? Do you think it's 10 hours? 20? 50? 50. Okay, so you believe, believe it or not, they have one person 
for the entire shower here, which has 15 minutes. So if you want to get your data files done for your gameplay, then that's what you get. So you write an email and you wait for five, five minutes. Uh, so just to let you know what other challenges we are facing right now. Um, that's the team. Um, if you are interested in more project, projects of Game of Berlin, so we are thinking about the Museum of the Future with the Humboldt Forum in Berlin um, and have other very interesting projects. Just have a look on the, on the website. We are always looking for collaborators. Thank you. Spectrum 
in the design process. So they meet with us and they give us feedback, iterative feedback during the game development. Our other target audience um, is the administrator, the researcher, and we also involve psychologists and individuals, researchers in speech to assess our game and give us feedback. And we've made changes based upon all of these, um, these groups' feedback. So from James Paul G, one thing that he emphasizes is just-in-time instructions, that we should develop games that aren't busy with instructions all the time and not too much information, and that we should have the information just in time, just when you need it in the game, and we should be able to turn it on and off. We want to develop games that are pleasantly frustrating. That is, that they're not so difficult that people give up, and they're not so easy that people are bored and don't want to play them. Also, we want the players to co-design. That is, that they get to decide a little bit about how the game is progressing. Specifically, in our game, we let them pause the game. They can speed up or slow down. There are hints along the way that they can access. And there isn't real like, losing in our game. So that, because we want to foster learning. We want, to, we want the individuals who are playing it to really learn about emotion recognition. We're using the six universal emotions that are identified by Ekman, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, surprise, and anger. The corpora that we're using in our demo are from NIMSTIM, so there are a lot of images out there. This is a very highly regarded uh, corpus. And the speech is from Ravdez. And what's significant about their corpus is that the speech is context neutral. So you can't tell from what the actors are saying what they're feeling. It had, you have to pick it up from how they're saying it, from their intonation. So this is a screenshot, and I'll be doing a demo as well. In the, um, in the screenshot, I'll point out some of the, the features. So the gameplay is that the player is presented with two images although it could be modified to have up to four images. And they are also, they hear, as soon as the level plays, they hear the speech. They hear the audio of a particular emotion, and then they have to shoot the right image that matches it. Along the way, if they don't know the uh, answer, they can access these just-in-time instructions, and they can play the sound again over here. They can pause the rate, the, the spaceships fall, and they can speed that up and slow it down. They get feedback over here, um, and the feedback is great if they do well, and if they don't, it's try again. So there's no wrong or, you, just, you lose just a few points for missing it, but you get more points for getting it. So there's a lot of positive feedback. And there's a hint, if you press H, you get a hint. And that the administrator can specify not only the, the images and the sound, but also if they want to put a hint, it could be a sentence, it could be a single word um, for the player. The significant feature of this game is that the domain expert, the researcher, determines the trial. So that they, they specify a three files or any number of files, a high level file that says the levels that they're going to be using. And then with e within each level, they specify which sounds, which voices they want to play, which images it's going to match, which are correct. So they control what is being shown within the game. It's driven by this text file, which is a, from a spreadsheet. They can just input a spreadsheet into the game. And it also controls the progress of the, brain, the game, what comes first, what comes second. So here's an example of the high level. I call the game for change one, game for change two. So it's going to be two levels in this example in my demo. And then 
within each level, uh, they can specify a comment field, which is ignored, so they want to, it's like a spreadsheet, and then they specify a WAV file, images, an asterisk next to the one that's correct, and then a hint, okay? So that's the first one. So this will be in the demo that I'm showing. And here's the second one. And you can also specify your own. You can record your own uh, audio and you can do your own images so that you can present images of the, of the, the student on the autism spectrum, the player. You can have their peers, their family members, um, images of them audios of them as well. Okay, so I'm going to do, do the demo. Um, the, the researcher who gave us the NIMSTIM asked us that this not be filmed. So uh, when we post our slides, we'll put up an example that doesn't use that corpus. So please don't film the, the demo. But the, the slides, I'll put up a demo that, has, uh, that doesn't include those images. So over here is where the researcher would put in the, the file that defines all the levels that they want to have their trials on. Okay, I have it preloaded. Kids are talking by the door. I'm going to pause it. Okay, so which one uh, do you think it is? Okay, so just raise your hand if you think it's this one. How many of you think it's this one? Okay, great. So, over there, and then we shoot it. Kids are talking by the door. Okay, I'll pause it so that we have time to, uh, and then if you didn't hear it, right, play again. Kids are talking by the door. Okay, and the just in time instructions, you could put on and off at any time. Okay, so. How many of you think it's this one? Okay, this one? Oh, that's a good, good group, okay. So, uh, oh, let's say we do the wrong one just to show that, okay. Kids are talking by the door. Okay, so let's just try again. And if there were three or four images, it wouldn't just be the other one. Dogs are sitting by the door. <laughs> okay, so you see that the sentences are are content neutral, right? Okay, how many think this one? Okay, this one? Okay, so, great. I did all male, and level two, I did all female, just to give you an idea of what researchers might want to do. Okay, so I'll just play it one more time now. This one? This one? Okay. And then if you're not sure, you do the hint also. There's a hint there. It could be just a sentence, or it could be the actual motion.